What's up, apes? Welcome back to the Daily Peels video stream of the day. My name is David. It is, of course, a beautiful Monday here, June 3rd, 2024. It is currently 9.23 p.m., which means it's way past my bedtime, so apologies in advance if we get a little bit crazy on this call here, but we are going to do our best to get you guys ready for the markets here on Tuesday morning, June 4th. We're getting into the summer trades now. I mean, we've kind of been on that vibe for a little bit, but let's get into the exciting part of the year where we can say, okay, this is what the first half did. This is what we're looking at for the second half. We can start to make year-over-year -year comparisons that actually matter in this case. Now, year-over-year -year comparisons are fine. What I don't want to talk about today is day-over-day -day comparisons, and that's because the WSL portfolio is down about 17 basis points on the session. That puts our year-to-date return down to 8.54%, which is still pretty respectable, but absolutely embarrassing compared to the S&P and the NASDAQ, both are remaining over 10% for the year so far. Now, we did underperform on the day, at least. I mean, once again, both the NASDAQ and the S&P were higher as big tech companies basically carry the entire indexes. It's pretty easy when you put a quarter of your indexes into literally the best businesses ever in human history. Now, we, on the other hand, we're not sheeple like a bunch of these fucking portfolio manager out here, closeted passive managers, we're taking some stances. And so, you know, it's going to be a little bit rocky, but with these new positions, we expect long-term acceleration. And we actually have a new report that's going to be dropping for WSO Alpha at some point this week. This one is going to be on Tilray. So expect a very interesting breakdown of the cannabis sector. I don't think that our take is going to be exactly what you're expecting. So definitely stay tuned for that and go sign up for WSO Alpha. I mean, if you don't, like I've said a couple of times on here now, you are officially dead to me. So Let's go ahead and get into the big story of the day here. We're skipping the banana bits. We're skipping all that bullshit and going right into Macro Monkey. Because we have one big question to ask today. And that is, man, you factoring? That's our question for the U.S. economy right now because it seems like absolutely nobody is. You know, I'm calling my dad. I actually did call him earlier today or text him at the very least. And he is a, he's allegedly a carpenter, which means presumptively that you go out there and build shit, but nobody's building anything in the U.S. economy right now, so maybe I should call my mom and tell her to figure out what the hell he's doing all day, because clearly he's not building anything. We got construction reports, we got manufacturing reports here on Monday and at the close of last week. We got to talk about how this all fits together and what it means for the broader U.S. economy. So, getting into some of the important numbers here today, the most important was probably the ISM PMI. So, for those of us who don't speak absolute fucking nerd virgin finance, bro, ISM PMI stands for the Institute of Supply Management Purchasing Managers Index. Now, what does that mean? Basically, this ISM Institute sends out a survey to a bunch of purchasing managers across the United States, depending on what sector they're in. Now, for the manufacturing PMI, that's going to go to, you guessed it, manufacturing companies. So they're asking purchasing managers and manufacturing organizations what their expectations are for purchases over the next X period, whatever kind of period they're looking at could be monthly, quarterly, annual. In this case, we're talking about monthly, as we mostly do with most of our economic reports. And we absolutely shit the bed last month. So the PMI report, because it's a survey, this is something that the U.S. government is capable to keep track of, to like kind of actually count in real time. Like they should be able to do for everything if they were using literal fucking pre-color TV technology for most of our data collection. But Either way, I digress. The ISM PMI declined to 48.7%. It was quite a steep drop from right around the 50 level in the month of April. Now, for those of us who don't speak fucking nerd virgin macro, bro, basically what the ISM PMI measures is against the baseline of 50. So a baseline of 50, if your reading is at 50, you're completely neutral. You didn't change at all from the previous period. Above 50 means that you expanded. Below 50 means that you contracted. And 42.5% is kind of like the line of where it should get concerning. At least that's what the ISM is starting to say right now. So seeing it at 48.7%, the level itself isn't necessarily concerning, but the direction that we're heading in absolutely is. And as always, the direction is going to be much more important than the level. Remember, it's not about good or bad. It's about better or worse when it comes to investing. So the overall PMI was pretty bad, but this is made up of a couple of different sectors. There's basically five, six things that go into the overall PMI, and that's employment, deliveries, production, inventory, supplies, and you guessed it, new orders. Pretty much all of them were flat to lower. The only one that moved higher was employment, somehow, 51.1%, I guess. My guess is that illegal immigration has something to do with that, and that a lot of these employees aren't exactly registered or exactly how that works. You know, I don't really know how to count that kind of stuff, but it seems like it might make sense because, you know, everybody's freaking out about the southern border, but it seems like those are the only people coming over here building shit, so I don't know why everybody's so fucking mad about it. Somebody tell my dad to go build shit. Anyway, 
Moving on down, the new order section of the PMI was actually at 55, 45.4% for the quarter. So new orders, manufacturing PMI, 45.4%. It was quite the decline from the prior period. It was over 50 for April, and now we've swung all the way back down to 45.4%, much steeper than the PMI. Now, the interesting thing here is that manufacturing is a leading economic indicator for the U.S. economy, but within manufacturing itself, new orders is a leading indicator for manufacturing. So this is a leading indicator square that we have right here, and it is plummeting lower. This could mean a lot of different things. Now, it is a relatively short time period to be looking at this, and in all things considered, it's not a concerning amount. Like, if we plunge to 35 that would be terrible, but no, that's only what the Chicago business barometer did. And this is basically the purchasing managers that, oh my God, I haven't been showing the charts at all. So let's go ahead and backtrack a little bit. This is the overall PMI. As you can see, we were doing well. The immediate post-COVID period back in 2022, we should the bed in 23. We started to recover a little bit and we're turning right around in the wrong direction here. Now it was even worse for the new order section of the purchasing manager index, as we can see right here, completely plummeting from that prior line down to 45.4 percent so it's been a relatively steep drop but again not necessarily something to freak out about just quite yet we'll get back to this next chart in just a quick minute but i want to talk about the chicago business barometer because this is basically the pmi for businesses in the chicago area that's the midwest it's all the manufacturing in the united states effectively this actually did plummet to 35 it's actually even lower 30 or a little bit higher 35.4 percent is what we're seeing for the chicago business barometer then if we go back to this prior chart, this is total construction spending in the United States. So it looks nice and pretty. It's moving up and to the right, but actually declined last month by 0.1%. Again, very small amount, but we here at the Daily Peel, we're like the fucking CIA for macro and markets. Like we are paying attention to things that nobody cares about or nobody else really cares about because we want to stay on top of things. We're kind of like that neurotic, like extremely you know sensitive kind of person that's freaking out about everything kind of like my dog when he hears the wind blow or somebody walk by the door that's basically what we are over here so it's nothing to freak out about just yet but it's definitely a trend worth paying attention to because obviously a falling apart manufacturing sector is not going to bode well for the rest of the economy so manufacturing being a leading indicator we're seeing all of these declines pretty much across the board doesn't bode well but again this is survey data it's the construction spending data is also from the month of April, but it starts to get concerning when you add these all up together. Like, you know, construction spending declining 0.1%, who gives a fuck? It could be seasonal adjustments, it could be any number of factors going on. But when you add all of these things up together, plus the recent retraction that we've seen in consumer spending, especially in that last PCE report on Friday, we saw a decline in real disposable personal income and uh, consumer spending from the PCE report. So, Factoring all these things together, it doesn't seem like the second half of 2024 is going to be all sunshine and rainbows like we were expecting. So that's basically the main macro story of the day. Let's go ahead and with all that said, move on into some of our market stories. So we have some big stock movers of the day and oh my God, that one was bigger than fucking GameStop once again. Somebody needs to slap me in the fucking portfolio and call me Ben Graham because I am happy to be the internet's biggest hater on meme stocks. That is some that is a title I will take with glee. So, on Sunday, late Sunday night, to the point where I was like going to bed, I wasn't even going to put this in the peel, but I had to do it for the love of the game. Deep fucking value comes onto Reddit in a different subreddit. It's not Wall Street Bets. He was actually in r slash super stonks. He posted his GME YOLO update, and it was absolutely unbelievable. This guy somehow has a bag worth $210 million in GameStop right now. Greatest retail trader in the world. I don't give a fuck what anybody else says. He's got about 5 million shares of the company and then about 120,000 options contracts. His options contracts are worth about $65.7 million, at least as of Friday's close because that's what it would be showing on Sunday night. So, you know, obviously it boomed today because GME was up 21%. Other meme stocks like AMC were also up. And DFV, his call options that he has on GameStop expire on June 21st. So as long as the stock is above $20 per share by then, this guy is going to be... I mean, he really might become a billionaire. He might be the first billionaire off of pure degenerate gambling day trading alone. And quite honestly, if you're able to raise an army of Redditors to back your trade, you honestly deserve billions of dollars. I'm happy to contribute to that fund, just not to the GME stock itself. So, you know, these things, they took flight there. It's absolute nonsense. There's no business plan behind any of these. It's just easy to hype up and the short interest helps kind of pump the stock when moments like this happen. Anyway, let's go on to a real company. And of course, we are talking about Spotify. You've heard the expression, don't fight the Fed. It's one of the most 
popular expressions in all of finance. Well, Spotify hasn't heard it yet. This company is actively out here fighting the Fed on every level. We're all trying to get rid of inflation. Spotify, they raised their prices last week. So, or this week, they're going to be raising their prices is what they announced, I should say. So this company, basically what they said is that U.S. individual and duo plans are both getting bumped up $1 and family plans are getting bumped up $3. Now, college students out there, relax. Your plans are staying exactly the same. It's not going to cost you any more money to run your playlist at the fucking pro-Palestine encampment or whatever you guys are doing these days. Whatever protest is hot this week. Your playlists aren't going to cost any more money. It's still going to be the same at five ninety nine. But investors were obviously pretty hyped that the company is confident in itself that they'll be able to still drive user growth even with this higher revenue tag. Now, for somebody like me who needs my Spotify more than I need water, food, oxygen, love, basically everything. Like, I'll take Spotify over it all, quite honestly. This makes sense. They could charge me $1,000 a month that I would go homeless just to still have Spotify. So I can't really be too mad. The only thing I'm wondering is, I mean, being a Swedish company, aren't these guys all about welfare? Why are they charging me more money? That just seems a little bit rude, a little bit anti-Swedish, but, you know, it is what it is. That probably doesn't have the same sting as calling somebody anti-American. Moving on down below into a British company here, we have GSK. This is one of the largest healthcare companies in the world, and, you know, they took an interesting beat here. Most healthcare companies like to try to cure cancer. GlaxoSmithKline is actively out here spreading it. So, basically what happened and brought the stock down 8.7% on the day was the fact that a U.S. court in Delaware allowed about 70,000 cases to go forward into the legal system that are alleging that GSK's drug uh, called Zantac, this is a heartburn drug, it causes cancer. So, you know, got a little bit of heartburn, too bad, now you got cancer too. That's basically what GSK says. So investors obviously dump the stock in a response. Probably going to buy it up tomorrow, quite honestly. Those kinds of stories, like these legal cases, they're very emotional and headliney, but it's not going to do anything to the actual business. I mean, this is a big buying opportunity if you're looking to get in on large cap healthcare. Anyway, speaking of large cap healthcare, Boston Beer Company. This is the epitome of a healthcare stock, if you ask me. However, they were down about 3.5% on the session. Wasn't necessarily anything bad. It was more so just like something really good was on the line at the end of last week, and it was killed this week. So this company, Sam Adams, he has come a long way from dumping tea in the harbor, and now he is the one actually being dumped himself because... On Friday, the Wall Street Journal, for whatever fucking reason, reported that a Japanese whiskey company called Suntory was in talks to merge with Boston Beer. So these companies, they've worked together before in the past on distribution of some bullshitty-ass drinks that you probably bought. I probably bought, too. But Boston Beer, they came out and, along with Suntory on Monday and basically said, we are not in merger talks. The reason that investors were hyped is because it would have been done at a premium to Boston Beer's value uh, at as of the close on Friday. So it was talking about about a $3 billion dollar price tag for the merger overall, which would, of course, be a um, premium valuation for Boston Beer Company. But obviously, since it's going away, shares sold off. They lost that hope. But still, Boston Beer, they're still out here selling Sam Adams, Angry Orchard, and of course, everybody's favorite drink to enjoy when they're underage, Twisted Tea. So they're still staying hot. I mean, the company has been falling off a cliff for a while because Americans don't like to drink beer anymore. Once again, Americans don't like to be American. Sweden still like to be Swedes. It is what it is. The world's going to shit. Anyway, Ethereum, it's their turn to eat before the world completely falls apart, I guess, because on May 23rd, the SEC surprisingly, very unexpectedly approved spot ETFs for Ethereum. So this is a little bit complicated. Let's take a step back a little bit. Bitcoin is the king of digital assets. It has a market cap of around the same as that of like Meta. Ethereum is closer to like United Health Group or ExxonMobil on a good trading day for Ethereum. So somewhere in the 450 to 500 billion dollar range, at least as of right now. So this is the second largest cryptocurrency in the world. Bitcoin, we've talked about this before. In order to mine it, you basically need a computer that can solve math problems like, you know, incredibly complicated, like logic, whatever, random bullshit ass problems in order to quote unquote mine the next cryptocurrency to validate transactions and keep the blockchain running. With Ethereum, it's a little bit less complicated. So it's called proof of stake instead of proof of work. Basically, all that means is that instead of a race to figure out this math problem, it's more like a lottery style system. It's kind of luck based. So basically, you take your Ethereum, you can effectively lend it or just like lock it up in the Ether blockchain. So what they do is they use those locked up Ether to validate transactions. It's called that proof of stake. The more coins that you have staked to the higher odds that you're going to get chosen to select that. So well, this is contributing to inequality in the United States and around the world, but still, it does a lot of cool shit at the same time. So that's kind of how they validate their chain. It's this proof of stake method. Costs a lot less energy, so it's a lot less friendlier to the grid overall. 
Now, the SEC has had their problems with Ethereum in the past because the difference here is with Ethereum, because you can lock it up for that proof of stake, that's how you're earning a return. It's not like you need a whole mining operation to be doing it to actually make money on. You're basically lending your ETH to the Ethereum blockchain for as long as you want. Uh, usually there's like a minimum kind of period, I'm pretty sure, in order to actually make any money off of it. But the average annual EPR is somewhere in the range of about 2 to 4%. So the SEC said this is a security. You have to register with us. Ethereum, Coinbase, Kraken, a bunch of these other companies said, fuck you. No, we don't. They went back and forth for a while and ultimately the SEC won. But now these are a bunch of spot ETF companies have basically been approved to list spot Ethereum ETFs as well. So Let's take a look at the price action in response to that news because this is a chart for the last three months. You can barely see this at all, but this leg higher was on the day that of the approval. And that brought it right back to the high seen at the beginning of March or in about mid-March. The Ides of March, if you will, are at Peter Julius Caesar. So it's pretty interesting to see that it spiked back up, but not nearly to the level that Bitcoin did. But it's probably because there is going to be a whole lot less investor interest for this asset. First and foremost, my grandmother has absolutely no idea what Ethereum is, but she could probably stumble her way through pronouncing Bitcoin. So it's something that the general populace is a lot more aware of is Bitcoin. You sound like an absolute, once again, this is your absolute loser virgin crypto bro. It's when you say Ether or Ethereum. And don't even get me started on the Solanas of the world. But Ethereum, the reason that it's going to have less investor interest is one, from a name recognition side of things. And then two, it's from a rational investing side of things. Because you can earn a return if you own the asset on itself and you just stake it to the chain. But when it's in the ETF, one of the stipulations of the SEC was that you are not allowed to stake Ethereum in these ETFs. So you're not going to be earning any income off of this. Why would investors be buying it when you can get price exposure and the return just by holding the digital coin itself? These spot ETFs, it's pure laziness. That is the only reason we're not wanting to, not knowing how to open a fucking MetaMask wallet and just get the exact same exposure. So, you know, it's the exact same companies that are going to be making their bag off this. I know you can't see it, but basically we have ARC, we have... BlackRock, we have Fidelity, Franklin Templeton, Invesco, Vanek, literally the same cast of characters that did this for the spot Bitcoin ETF. So they're here to make even more money off it. It's hella ironic when you consider that Larry Fink, uh, just a couple of years ago, he seemed closer to investing in fucking MySpace than Ethereum or Bitcoin or really any digital asset. So it's quite the irony to see these, you know, DeFi and traditional finance coming together more so than falling apart. It's very interesting to seeing the aftermath of 2020 and 2021 when they hated each other like cats and dogs. So it's quite the development for the finance space. It seems like instead of creating two different universes, they're just going to melge into melge, meld into one. So traditional finance, decentralized finance, probably going to become tra decentralized finance. And I'm coining that term right now. It is officially trademark copyrighted. If you say it, you owe me money and we are going to be coming at you all the way from the Daily Peel Global headquarters. That about does it for us for today. It's 9.41 p.m. My dog and my girlfriend are going to be quite upset that I have kept them awake for this long because it is literally past my bedtime. So I, I am not joking about that. To you college students out there, pay attention. This is going to be you in two or three years as well. But, you know, it is what it is for now. Let's go ahead and end on the quote of the day. We have Mr. But Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum himself. He said, the main advantage of blockchain technology is supposed to be that it's more secure. But new technologies are generally hard for people to trust. This paradox can't really be avoided. Phenomenal point. Like, yes, it's quote unquote trustless, but who the fuck is going to trust Satoshi Nakamoto more than the U.S. government? That might seem like a ridiculous statement right now, but back in 2012, when people still had their brains screwed on somewhat properly, it kind of made sense. So that about does it for us here today. Uh, you know, thank you guys for tuning in once again. We'll be back with you tomorrow because the Celtics don't play again until Thursday. Go fucking Celtics NBA Finals. First time we've been favored to win a final since 1986. So wish us luck out there. We will definitely need it. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Happy investing. Happy trading. Bye now.